Hello, everybody. And uh, right now, we're going to conclude our study of classical political economy by looking at Thomas Malthus. He's probably the most controversial person we've studied so far. Um, so we're going to look at Malthus's contributions and some of the debates he got into uh, with other theorists. Um, Malthus, as you will see, his main focus is on population. And his major contribution is about how population might impact the, um, impact the economy. And uh, he's notable for inventing the concept of a Malthusian catastrophe, which is basically where uh, population growth outstrips economic growth or outstrips the production of food and you know, causes a crisis as a result of that. Um, but it's not the only thing he talks about. There's a couple of other issues uh, which Malthus also discusses in his work, uh, which we'll discuss during today's talk. Um, one reason his theories are now becoming popular again, or there's renewed interest in them, is because, as we know, um, the expansion of the human population continues unabated. Um, and the implications of this for uh, either poverty or, more recently, um, environmental devastation uh, are bringing people back to studying Malthus in some way. It doesn't necessarily mean they agree with everything he has to say, but um, there is something to learn from his theories, perhaps. That's what a lot of people believe. So just some quick background on Malthus. Um, he was born in 1766, and he's the sixth son of his father, Daniel Malthus. Um, his father was an interesting guy. He had lots of important friends. Uh, David Hume, the philosopher, and Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, also a French philosopher. Um, it's interesting about Rousseau because Malthus later on gets into a um, criticism session about Rousseau, his father's uh, friend. So Malthus was a good student, a top level student at Cambridge, and he won prizes for various subjects such as Greek, Latin, and mathematics. He's a fairly well-rounded person. Uh, he finishes his MA, which was a big deal at the time, and becomes a religious leader with the Church of England. So um, we'll see in his work uh, that we can see some trace evidence of his religious orientation. But at the same time, uh, Malthus is no fundamentalist. He's committed to uh, scientific reasoning. And you don't have to be a follower of Christianity uh, to agree with part or all of Malthus's theories, that's for sure. Here's a quick look at his book when it was published. Uh, you know, an essay on the principle of population. And if you're doing the reading this week, um, this is the reading that I've said. Not the entire book, obviously. <laughs> um, I'll mention some important parts of the book and the quotes, most of the quotes in today's talk uh, come from this book itself. So population is definitely the center of Malthus's theory. Um, and in that way, his, con his biggest contribution is a conceptual one, um, recognition that population has a huge impact on the economy. Um, so far, the theorists that we've discussed, population is kind of like a side issue. It's not that it's not important, it's just not the most important thing. For Malthus, population is the most important thing. And he generally has this belief that human beings are not very good at controlling population. Now, what's interesting about this is that he believed this all the way back in the 1800s. Um, at that time, the world population was about 900 million to 1 billion people. Now, just think about how horrified he would be or, or how right he would think that he was. You know, when today the world's population is like 7.7 .7 or more billion people. Um, Malthus, if he was sitting here talking to us, maybe he'd say, you know, I always told you guys you sucked at controlling population. Um, look, you've proven me right. You know, you've <laughs> multiplied you, yourselves by seven since my time. So whatever you might think about Malthus's argument, um, a major reason he continues to convince some people um, is this idea that the population is putting a stress on the planet um, and uh, that it seems like um, ongoing poverty, you know, despite the fact that we've had massive global economic growth in, in the last you know, 150 years, um, we have not managed to solve the problem of poverty uh, yet. And um, that, that raises the possibility that, well, is it, is it just that we have too many people? You know, it's a, uh, an easy hypothesis about why there is this problem. So let's dive into his way of thinking a little bit. Um, Malthus in the book says, in all societies, even those that are the most vicious, the tendency to a virtuous attachment, and this is his words for marriage, virtuous attachment, uh, is so strong that there's a constant effort towards the increase of population. This constant effort, as constantly, tends to subject the lower classes of society to distress and to prevent any great permanent amelioration of their condition. 
right? So the modern English translation of that lovely statement is uh, people get married a lot, uh, especially poor people. Um, they have too many children and therefore they stay poor, right? Um, and that's kind of, I could almost stop the talk right now. I'm not going to, but you know, I could stop the talk right now. And as long as you remember that, you kind of get what he's all about, right? Um, so in a lot of ways, um, Malthus is responding to um, a lot of thinkers of his time who were incredibly optimistic uh, that the world was going to get better really quickly. You know, um, there were friends of his father, like Rousseau and Hume, and they, they were totally convinced that if we just apply scientific reason, the world's going to solve all of its problems pretty soon, right? And one really big example of this um, is the Marquis de Courcey, who basically argued even more than this, that humans could become perfect. The perfectibility of our species is an actual possibility, right? So Malthus is offering a degree of skepticism towards this perspective. Um, he's skeptical, obviously, of the idea that we could become perfect, uh, but he's also skeptical of the idea that humanity as a whole could improve its condition based on the current circumstances. So um, here's this, uh, quest for perfection, he says, and well, um, his response is to say, the natural inequality of the two powers of population and of production of the earth and that great law of our nature, which must constantly keep their effects equal, form the great difficulty that appears to me insurmountable in the way to the perfectibility of society. Now, the simple way of saying that, of course, is that population seems to grow much faster than food. And if that's the case, Good luck perfecting mankind. Good luck becoming perfect when so many people are hungry or poor or that sort of thing. You know, um, maybe it makes more sense to talk about becoming perfect once we've solved some of the most fundamental long existing problems that have been human problems as long as human beings have existed. So the next section of his theory basically says people have a tendency to increase the population and as a result of this, various forms of stress emerge. So he says, let's suppose the means of subsistence in any country is just equal to the easy support of its inhabitants. In other words, we can make just enough stuff um, to replicate our existing living standard. And he says, the constant effort towards population, the increases in the number of people before the means of subsistence are increased. It's much easier to make a bunch of children than it is to substantially raise the productivity of, of an entire country and its agriculture. So the food therefore, which supported 7 million before must now be divided among 7 million and a half or 8 million. The poor consequently must live much worse and many of them may be reduced to severe distress. The number of laborers are also above the proportion of the work in the market. So here's a second problem. Population seems to grow faster than we can make jobs for people in a lot of places, in a lot of ways. You know, so, um, you know, I don't want to push my own research, but I, one of the articles that I wrote on India one time basically measured this. So, well, if we compare labor force growth and population growth to job growth, uh, what we see is that in the entire post-liberalization period, um, India has never had a year, a single year where the number of jobs uh, outgrew the number of people being added to the workforce. And that's kind of a terrifying proposition. So um, the number of laborers also being above the proportion of work in the market, what is the result of this? Well, the price of labor must tend towards a decrease. The price of provisions would rise. There's less and less work, so labor becomes cheaper. There's more and more competition for food, so food becomes more expensive. The laborer therefore must work harder to earn the same as he did before. Okay. And the big problem that's sort of not addressed by this quote is that there is a physical limit to how hard people can work. You know, once we've hit that, uh, people start to, you know, wear out, get malnourished, die, that sort of thing. So um, basically there are some impacts as a result of population increase. When population grows faster than food output, the price of food is likely to increase and the price of labor is likely to decrease. Okay. This means people work harder for less money. And um, this is a general cause of misery for all. However, the poorest people are going to be the worst impacted by all of this. And this is why uh, Malthus had such a dismal view of social progress. So here's <laughs> one thing interesting about Malthus is uh, like, I, I'm not a Malthusian myself, and, um, but, but 
I do find his writing style interesting. It's, I guess, something you can learn from as well um, when we're studying this type of thing. It's not just the theory of political economy itself, but um, sometimes it's a good idea to experiment with different writing styles uh, because you never know what type of voice is inside you, okay? Now, Malthus definitely does the dismal doomsday voice uh, especially well, and you can see that in the writing that I've cited today. So. During this season of distress, the discouragements to marriage and the difficulty of rearing a family are so great, the population is at a stand. In the meantime, the cheapness of labor, the plenty of laborers, and the necessity of increased industry among them encourage cultivators to employ more labor upon their land, to turn up fresh soil, to manure and improve more completely what's already in tillage, till ultimately the means of subsistence become the same proportion to the population as at the period from which we set out. Um, the situation of the labourer being then again tolerably comfortable, the restraints to population are in some degree loosened, and the same retrograde and progressive movements with respect to happiness are repeated. In other words, he's looking at times when, well, okay, uh, when the price of labour drops, uh, what happens? Uh, all the landlords are like, this is a bargain, we can hire heaps of farm labourers, they're all cheap as anything and desperate for work. What's the likely result of that? Um, agriculture suddenly gets a boost in productivity. Okay, When agriculture gets a boost in productivity, uh, the net result is that the price of farm commodities drops, so people are relieved from poverty. And so that kickstarts the cycle again. When people are relieved from poverty, he thinks people are going to go out and have more children and stuff. All right. so the population stops growing because people can't afford to get married and lots of people die due to poverty. Labor becomes cheap. Landlords employ a lot of agricultural labor. Productivity of the land goes up, the price of food gets reduced, right? So we're swinging now from misery to prosperity to misery to prosperity, and that's the problem. So humanity swings between prosperity and crisis. And uh, this is, um, in a nutshell, the way that Malthus understands these cycles of human affairs, right? So humanity is uncontrollably swinging between prosperity and growth, between crisis and decline. And in a lot of ways, he's one of the first people, um, even before Marx and the Marxist theorists, uh, to point out that there is an inbuilt crisis mechanism in the system that we have. You know, it's not a stable system. Forget this equilibrium stuff. Um, it's just one crisis and then a, like another, another boom, and then a crisis and then a boom. And there's no real stable pattern here, uh, except inevitable crisis. So his predictions become darker still uh, because he says, the only reason we avoid an even more serious crisis is because we have things like war, famine, and epidemic disease um, that stop it from happening, that, that limit the population uh, by killing people, basically, um, and that stops a more broad systemic crisis from happening. So he says, the power of population is so superior to the power of the earth to produce subsistence for man that premature death must, in some shape or other, visit the human race. The vices of mankind are active and able ministers of depopulation. They are the precursors in the great army of destruction and often finish the dreadful work themselves. But should they fail in this war of extermination, sickly seasons, epidemics, pestilence and plague advance in terrific array and sweep off their thousands and tens of thousands. Should success be still incomplete, gigantic inevitable famine stalks in the rear and with one mighty blow levels the population with the food of the world. That's a terrifying little passage. <laughs> uh, hopefully you don't have bad dreams about, you know, death and disease and stuff. So um, breaking this down, what are the factors that can prevent population growth? Okay, is there hope? Well, Malthus argues that we can do a couple of things that can limit population growth. Um, on the one hand, there are positive factors. Um, I know it says positive factors, and we're gonna say positive factors are things that raise the death rate. He's not arguing that it's good that people die. Um, positive just meaning increasing the death rate. So hunger, disease, and war. Obviously nobody likes any of these things, right? Um, they're all negative things. Nobody wants to be hungry, suffer disease, nobody wants to be in conflict, okay? On the other hand, there are preventative factors. These are the slightly more positive things. So what can we do to lower the birth rate? Okay, Malthus was not an advocate for birth control because he wrote this, um, th this book before most modern forms of birth control existed. So, you know, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, however, he was an advocate for delayed marriage. He says the longer you can delay marriage, 
um, and delay the start of becoming uh, you know, a childbearing or fertility or that sort of thing, um, the better off a society would be, okay? And celibacy, he was also an advocate of celibacy. So, you know, no sex, no kids, fairly obvious way to dis <laughs> dissuade yourself from having population growth, um, right? So, you know, in a lot of respects, um, people will argue that that's a fairly typical thing for a religious leader to say, but we'll move on to the policy implications of this area. Um, equally important is Malthus's argument that economic growth is not gonna solve the problem necessarily. Um, in fact, that it's not. So um, unlike many people today who have a lot of faith that economic growth is gonna take away every single problem that we have, um, Malthus was one of the first economic growth pessimists. And he said, um, if the progress was really unlimited, it might be increased ad infinitum, right? So imagine it's possible to have permanent economic growth forever and there are no physical limits to production. Sure, but this is so gross an absurdity that we might be quite sure that among plants as well as among animals, there is a limit to improvement. Though we do not know exactly where it is, it is probable that the gardeners who contend for plow prizes have often applied stronger dressing without success. At the same time, it would be highly presumptuous in any man to say that he'd seen the finest carnation or anemone that could ever be made to grow. He might, however, assert without the smallest chance of being contradicted by a future fact that no carnation or an enemy could ever be cultivated to be increased to the size of a large cabbage. And yet, there are assignable quantities much greater than a cabbage. No man can ever say he's seen the largest ear of wheat, the largest oak that could ever grow. But he might easily, and with perfect certainty, name a point of magnitude at which they would not arrive, okay? In all these cases, therefore, a careful distinction should be made between an unlimited progress and a progress where the limit is merely undefined. Right, so let's break this down in simple terms. Um, his argument is just because we can't say that we've reached the end of economic growth doesn't mean we can say with certainty that there is a limit to economic growth, okay? Um, there is no way, for example, we can double the size of the global economy as it exists today um, without serious, with serious consequences, right? Um, everybody in the world at the moment is talking about reducing emissions targets and, you know, uh, green production and all that sort of thing. Um, so there's no way we could double the amount of pollution in the world right now um, without completely wiping ourselves out. I think that's the scientific consensus. Um, and in a way, uh, that's kind of what he's hinting at here. So, okay, yes, we can make agriculture more productive. Yes, we, we probably haven't reached the physical limits of agricultural productivity, right, or human productivity yet. But um, it is pretty stupid not to believe that a physical limit exists. Okay, soil can only grow so much stuff. Um, agriculture can only get so productive. It cannot grow forever. And because it can't grow forever, um, his argument is we need to confront a much more terrible problem, which is, well, um, how do we plan for the fact that there are limits to growth? So there's a limit to growth and especially a hard limit on agricultural growth. The land can only produce so much food uh, and beyond a certain point, it's not possible to increase the productivity of the land. Land is also, new land is generally less productive than land that's currently being farmed. Uh, that was something that we learned from Ricardo. Um, farmers have probably taken up the best land already. So any new farming land now that we introduce into cultivation uh, is probably going to be less productive than the old land, right? In addition to this, technology has limits. Um, there are no miracle crops. There are no miracle techniques uh, that can just technologically get us out of this problem. You know, technology can maybe buy us some time and increase productivity a little bit, but there's no long-term technological fix to these problems. So what's the solution? Well, Malthus, like a good religious leader, says moral restraint is the solution, okay? And immediately we feel like we're being nagged, right? Um, so it should be unsurprising to us that a religious leader would say this is the answer, but let's look seriously at his suggestions. Now, in the first place, Malthus is arguing we should delay getting into a serious relationship until we're economically independent and can support a family. And we might hate this, but this is actually pretty good advice um, whether it's individual advice, like this is good advice if you're giving it to a friend, you know, don't get married unless you're economically independent, um, is good advice. Uh, it's good advice at a governmental level too. Government should um, not necessarily force, oh, that's a separate topic, but 
Um, try and make sure people are economically independent before they get married, before they start families. Okay, equally unsurprising, Malthus is suggesting uh, that we remain celibate. In other words, we do not have sex before marriage, um, which further reduces the possibility of population growth. Now, let's be fair to the man. Um, obviously, if you say that now, you sound ultra conservative. Okay, but um, in Malthus's time, when he was making this suggestion of remain celibate, we have to remember that this was 50 years before the condom gets invented, right? It was 150 years before the contraceptive pill gets invented. So, you know, the op options that existed in his time for birth control were extremely limited. And this is why there's a new group of people, uh, Neo-Malthusians, um, who we'll talk about in a bit. Um, these people just support strong forms of birth control and say, well, we've invented, you know, these forms of birth control and therefore we don't have to be morally restrained. You know, we can, you know, do whatever we like sexually, um, but it no longer carries the necessity of population growth with it. You know, so strong forms of birth control may be a substitute to moral restraint um, if, we're, if we're unwilling or unable to morally restrain ourselves as Malthus wanted us to do. Okay, so um, in addition to this, Malthus, uh, it would surprise you, is a strong opponent of both welfare and charity. Now, when we think of behaviors that church leaders tend to support, often we associate church with charity and say they must go together. And that's what makes it interesting that he was a strong opponent of charity, right? So um, he argued that the problem with welfare and charity is that it continues the cycle of poverty. And the example he cites is the poor laws system in England. So for about 400 years, the poor laws guarantee that the state will provide some form of assistance for poor people uh, to prevent them from starving to death. And Malthus's argument is that, well, you're just kind of making the problem worse here. You're, you're removing the disincentive to you know, morally restrain and you're sort of perpetuating a problem. Malthus also pioneered the investigation into what's called a glut. A glut is where you've got too much production or too much supply of a specific good uh, and not enough money to buy that good or not enough willingness among the population to buy that good, which causes an economic crisis, right? So the technical term for this is overproduction or oversupply now. Uh, people don't like saying gluts anymore. Um, but basically, um, Malthus was taking on an established theory of his time, which is called Say's Law. Now, Say's Law still has a huge following in the economics profession. A lot of economists believe in it. And Say's Law says, a product is no sooner created than it, from that instance, affords a market for other products to the full extent of its own value. In other words, if you supply something, that creates the demand for that thing, right? In other words, there's no such thing as a glut. There's no such thing as overproduction. There's no such thing as oversupply. It's impossible. Now, the implication of Say's theory is that general gluts cannot occur. So economic crises based on overproduction are impossible. And he was wrong because Malthus's contribution anticipated a number of economic crises that would occur after he was long gone. So many of the biggest economic crises of the 20th century, for example, were overproduction crises you know, where there was just too much stuff and not enough money to buy that stuff. Okay. So his thinking on gluts would also be very influential on other theorists, yeah, major theorists that would go on to have a big impact on the world, right? Good examples are Karl Marx and John Maynard Keynes, who we'll study in the next, next couple of weeks. So these are two of the most influential economic theorists of all time. And both of them had a lot to do, uh, did a lot of thinking about this crisis of overproduction and how to manage the economy in such a way um, that, well, what do we have to do to prevent overproduction from occurring and stuff? You know, for Marx, um, we need to get to socialism before that can happen. For Keynes, um, government needs to manage the economy, right? They were only able to think about this, this possibility because of the preceding work that Malthus did on gluts. And even though both of those theorists, Marx and Keynes, um, disagree strongly with Malthus about a lot of things and criticize him heavily, um, they build upon his work on gluts. And that's, uh, that's why you know, um, his impact has to be respected in some way. So an implication of Malthus' theory of population concerns wages. And if it's true, that increased prosperity is just going to short term increase the population. Um, what that means is that if you're in power, if you're the government, 
and you're considering some possibilities um, of what you should do, raising wages is not a good idea, okay? Um, raising wages is not a good idea because that just gives people control over a bunch of money. They spend it recklessly on having more, pe having more people. Um, and instead, Malthus suggests we should have these preventative checks, right? If you want to really raise the standard of living of people, um, you need to implement these preventative checks. Stop people from, um, you know, doing the wrong thing to themselves. Stop people from hurting themselves through their own bad decision making. And give people access to, the Neo-Malthusians will argue, give people access to birth control and they'll stop themselves from making those bad decisions. Okay, so this is the subject of a major debate that Malthus has with David Ricardo. Now, in the Ricardo-Malthus debate, uh, Ricardo argued that, you know, when a country's population grows, capital or wealth gets accumulated, and this causes farming prices to fall, uh, which then causes poverty to kind of get ameliorated. So when the farmers then use the least productive land, as we saw, um, we expected that there would be a general decline in the profit rate for agriculture. Some landlords would get some money out of rent, but generally speaking, um, there would be a decline in the profit rate for agriculture, you know, because it's harder to farm the, the bad quality land. Now, Malthus said, actually, um, I strongly support protective tariffs for agriculture as being fundamental to guaranteeing any country's food security. Now, why is this interesting? Because as we remember, Ricardo strongly supported free trade and specialization, right? Um, Malthus is going to go completely the opposite way and say, actually, we need to fully protect agriculture, you know, um, protect agriculture and make sure that we can grow enough food to feed our own population. And who cares about this free trade stuff? You know, if you really want to help the population, if you really want to help the poor people, uh, first of all, you've got to guarantee that they have enough food to eat. You know? So um, regarding gluts, uh, Ricardo subscribed to this traditional view that, you know, the says law view. If there's an excess of one commodity, that just creates space for a different commodity instead. And eventually it's gonna balance itself out. Malthus argued, if everybody's gonna live on this subsistence level, um, there was gonna to have to be a vast oversupply of commodities because each worker is capable of producing a lot more than bare subsistence, uh, both for themselves and for their family. Um, in this way, Malthus is actually anticipating the Marxist overproduction argument which we'll look at um, in, in a little while. Um, he's then saying, well, how can we resolve this overproduction problem? And here's where he raises this concept. What if we create a class of unproductive consumers? Uh, imagine that. Um, whose role is to consume, simply consume most of the goods in the economy, right? And in this way, he's anticipating Torsten Veblen's idea, the theory of the leisure class, and the idea of conspicuous consumption, where we just like, have a group of people who spend most of their life uh, just having money and spending money and showing everybody how rich they are. Could that resolve one of the crisis points in our economic system, right? Does this class play this important role? Right? Now, at the time, uh, that class maybe didn't exist so much. They weren't so big and so notorious. Malthus is arguing for their creation, saying we need to bring this class into existence um, in order to resolve the economic crisis that we have. So um, Malthus is a very polarizing theorist and he attracted some extremely severe criticism uh, during his lifetime and ever since he's dead, even more criticism, right? This is the problem if you ever take a, if you ever make a big point, uh, you can expect to get attacked in a big way, okay? That's just, you have to have a thick skin if you're ever gonna have a big idea. Now, a lot of the criticism comes in the form of personal attacks and, you know, um, otherwise respectable theorists for some reason uh, get really get really angry with it. So Karl Marx said Malthus has taken the vow of celibacy and called him superficial, a professional plagiarist, the agent of the landed aristocracy, a paid advocate, and even the principal enemy of the people. Okay, these are all direct quotes. Now, um, to critique Marx, there's actually no evidence that Malthus ever plagiarized something. Okay, that's one problem. Um, so it's slander. Second, Malthus was the father of three children, so he was clearly not celibate. You know, his, <laughs> Marx was wrong about the idea of him being celibate, okay? 
Um, what's even more interesting about this is that Marxist analysis of overpopulation was saying some similar things to what Malthus was saying. Marx makes the argument uh, that capitalism creates a reserve army of labor. So a, a unemployment is not an accidental feature of capitalism. It's a deliberate creation of capitalism. Capitalism creates overpopulation and creates a system where there's more people than jobs because that's good for the capitalist, right? And Malthus pretty much agreed. Now, on the other hand, Friedrich Engels was one of the many people who thought science would solve the problem of food supply. You know, so he was a strong believer in technological solutions to some problems, not every problem. Um, Engels certainly argued for political solutions to a lot of problems. But when it came to the food supply, um, he was strongly optimistic that science alone would end world hunger. Okay, and we can see, uh, you know, 150 years later or whatever, he was wrong. You know, science has not even come close to solving the problem of world hunger, even in 2020. So um, another interesting point is that Marxist thinkers would often criticize Malthus um, in words, but then support his policies in action, right? Lenin's a good example. So Lenin considered Malthus theories to be, and this is a quote, reactionary doctrine. So he's criticizing his position and saying, you're not very progressive here, but then supported his policies on family planning and delayed marriage. You know, the Soviet Union uh, strongly supported family planning policy and strongly supported a delay in the marriage age, which were policies that Malthus himself would exactly recommend. Malthus has been criticized by almost the entire spectrum of political thought, Marxist socialists, feminists, conservatives, nationalists, fascists, liberals, libertarians, defenders of human rights, Pretty much every single political thought in existence has had something negative to say about Malthus in some way. And if you've earned that much hate, um, you've probably, I don't know, in my opinion, you've probably said something right, at least at some point in your life. Uh, now, this brings us to the Neo-Malthusians. Now, after the Second World War, um, one really important event that we see is the introduction globally of mechanized agriculture. And in particular, there was an event uh, called the Green Revolution, which introduced pesticides, fertilizers, and high yield crops to agriculture. And the direct result of this is a short term growth in the food supply. And you think, oh, a short term growth in the food supply. Oh, I've heard this claim before. Yes, Malthus said, what if there's a short term growth in the food supply? Okay. In addition to this, uh, if we use Malthus's framework and we look at the 20th century, what we'll also see is there's a de decline in what he called the positive factors or positive checks. Preventable disease definitely declined in the 20th century. Why? Because of the invention of antibiotics and you know a bunch of other medical advances. On the other hand, um, what's the good side? Um, according to his theory, there was also an increase in preventative checks. So contraceptives become more available than ever before globally. Although we have to respect the fact that um, more available in some countries than other countries, right? Some access to contraception is still a big issue in many countries. So we shouldn't you know, say that this is a, a universal thing. But in a lot of places, um, contraceptive availability increases substantially, especially compared to Malthus's time. Now, certain theorists predicted the result of this would be a Malthusian catastrophe. You know, what if population growth results um, and what if we eventually find ourselves in the situation again, uh, where population growth outstrips food production growth yet again? You know, um, uh, could, could that happen to us now? You know, is, is, that, is that a realistic scenario that could occur? Now, at least part of Malthus's prediction is uncontestably true in that sense that the world production of food has increased um, and as a result, this has enabled population growth, right? Uh, there's no way we can have the level of population that we do now without the increase in the production of food. Um, the positive factors have simultaneously decreased. So there's fewer world wars or large scale wars than ever before, fewer famines than ever before, and there's reductions in disease. And this has led a bunch of theorists to become worried that the human population is going to increase um, environmental problems to an unsustainable level. I'm going to cite some examples in case you want to do some further research here. So one is Garrett Hardin. Um, he wrote uh, an article called Tragedy of the Commons. Uh, and in this essay, he argues that a finite world, so a limited world, 
can only support a finite population and that freedom to bring greed will bring ruin to all, right? So Hardin is explicitly attacking the idea that, the, that the, um, the right to decide to have children and how many children you want to have as a human right is not a sustainable human right. You know, he was arguing against that being a human right. Next, we have the Club of Rome. Uh, this was an NGO who in 1972 published uh, The Limits to Growth. And this was uh, an ar argument against permanent economic growth, against the idea that we can continuously increase the economy forever. Um, they're making the proposition that at some point there is a physical limit to economic growth. Uh, Paul Ehrlich, who wrote the book, The Population Bomb, um, warns of the long-term consequences of population growth. So what we can see here is that long after he's dead, Malthus has influenced a bunch of thinkers and a bunch of movements. He influenced the steady state economics movement. Um, this is an argument about, can we increase human well-being without economic growth? You know, can we increase happiness or well-being or whatever, um, make the economy serve human needs more, but without growth? Um, and Malthus's ideas have also influenced even Marxist thinkers uh, beyond Marx, like Lee Min Chi or John Bellamy Foster, um, who are arguing that there are limits to the environmental exploitation of the earth. We need to think seriously about how much resources we're taking out of the earth at this point. So to summarize Malthus, um, if we look at his theory, number one, it's the argument that subsistence severely limits the population level, right? Um, when the means of subsistence increases, we can expect an increase in population. Um, population pressures stimulate increases in productivity. Um, the increases in productivity further stimulate population growth. So more food, more people. Because productivity cannot grow as fast as population, population needs strong checks to keep growth below capacity, right? Um, food supply is never going to grow as fast as people supply can. If we're really determined to have lots of people, um, there's no way food can catch up with that. Right, next, that individual cost-benefit decisions about sex, work, and children are going to determine the expansion and contraction of population and production. Right, so fortunately or unfortunately, uh, people have the ability to decide how much sex they have, um, how many children they're going to conceive, uh, not necessarily give birth to. That's a whole separate discussion, an ugly discussion we're not gonna get into today. Okay, um, number seven, checks will come into operation as population exceeds the subsistence level. So if we go above his subsistence level, um, some weird stuff is gonna start happening, right? Um, either people are gonna to start to die of hunger or other poverty related things, um, or social tension is gonna increase, which leads to the conflicts and the breaks out of war, um, or hopefully preventative checks come into place. People realize by themselves, I know there's too many people, uh, or government realizes for them and introduces population control measures, um, or people use contraceptive options or something like that. Now, the nature of these checks have a huge impact on the larger sociocultural system, right? If we do nothing, this is Malthus's argument, if we do nothing and wait for the positive checks to come into play, we're gonna have misery, vice, and poverty, right? If we just pretend like there's no problem and then all of a sudden people are dying of hunger and stuff, you know, that's gonna have a huge negative sociocultural impact. Right. If we're proactive and we take preventative measures, um, we can maybe possibly avoid some of these things. So um, I'm going to end on this quote because it's kind of, it summarizes his worldview, his writing style and all that sort of thing. Um, and I think it's kind of what makes his theoretical perspective uh, unique in a way. So through the animal and vegetable kingdoms, nature has scattered the seeds of life abroad with the most profuse and liberal hand. The germs of existence contained in this spot of earth with ample food and ample room to expand in would fill millions of worlds in the course of the thousands of years. Necessity, that imperious, all-pervading law of nature, restrains them with the prescribed bounds. Um, the race of plants and the race of animals shrink under this great restrictive law, and the race of man cannot, by efforts of reason, escape from it. Among plants and animals, its effects are a waste of seed, sickness, and premature death. Among mankind, misery and vice, right? So the short summary of that, there is no easy technological scientific solution 
uh, to our problems. We've got to think seriously about the political implications of everything that we do. And I'll leave it at that. All right, um, I hope you enjoy classical political economy. In the next talk, uh, we're gonna move on to discuss some more radical perspectives. Uh, we're gonna look at Karl Marx's critique of capitalism and Torsten Veblen's critique of the leisure class. See you then. <laughs>